What's going on everyone? Welcome back, Patrick here. And in this video, what we're gonna do is for each of these functions here, we're gonna find two things, f of negative one at four, and then f of f negative one at four. So what I'm first gonna do is I'm gonna first find this for all three functions, and then I'll find this for all three functions. So what this is saying is we need to find the value of the inverse at this value of four. And there's actually multiple ways to do it. So let's take this first function. We got f of x. Actually, you know what? Instead of writing f of x, I'm just gonna write y equals one over four to the power of x. So the first way we can do this is we can find what the actual inverse function or uh, equation is, and then we can just plug in that value of four for the x value in the inverse. Another way to do it, and a way that sometimes you will have to do it, is if we have a function and we have its inverse, I mentioned this previously in a video briefly, if we have an x value of a and a y value of b here, let's say, then the inverse is going to have an x value of b and a y value of a, right? They're just going to be interchanged. So notice here what they're asking for is what is the value of the inverse when the x value in the inverse is 4? So they're looking for that a value here. Well, notice with the function, that just means that they're looking for the x value when the y value is equal to four. Does that make sense? So to solve this, we can get the equation of the inverse or we can just plug in four for the y value in the function. Okay, one more time. So this uh, f negative one of four, that's the x value in the inverse, which is the same as the y value in the function. And then we could just solve for that x value in the function, and that's gonna be the y value in the inverse, at that x value of four in the inverse. All right, hopefully that made sense. So notice here, um, it's pretty easy to solve for four. We can just bring, um, we could bring this four up, so it'll become four to the power of negative one to the power of x. Then we can multiply these two. So we have four to the power of negative x equals four to the power of one. Notice how these are the same base. So that means negative x has to equal one, which means x is equal to negative one. And so that would be the answer. So that would be the x value in the function, which means it would be the y value in the inverse. And so that would be the answer of f of negative one f four, it would be negative one for this function. Okay, another way to do this, the reason why I wanted to bring this method uh, to your awareness is because sometimes it's gonna be tough to find the um, equation of the inverse. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to do that very smoothly. Like for example, in part C, as we'll see. Notice that we have a line here, 2x, and then we have an exponential function, 2 to the power of x. How are we going to find the inverse of that? It's going to be pretty difficult. Here, same thing. So if we have y equals 1 over 4 to the power of x, now if you remember, just in general, whenever you have y equals b to the power of x, right, some kind of base to the power of x, in this case the base is 1 over 4, if that's the function, then the inverse, this is a bit of a review from uh, grade 12, the inverse of an exponential function is a logarithmic function where you'll have um, y equals log base x. And so going back to this example, if we got y equals one over four to the power of x, the inverse of that is y equals log 
base 1 over 4 x. Okay, so what we can do here now is we could plug in 4 for this x value. So continuing this here, we'll have y equals log base 1 over 4, 4, which is the same as log of 4 over log of 1 over 4, if you remember your logarithmic rules. And when you do that in your calculator, you'd end up getting negative 1, which is exactly what we got when we did it the other way. Right, so that's another way to get it, but notice how it's a lot more complex. You got to bring in logarithms because you're dealing with an exponential function, so the inverse of that is always going to be a logarithm, et cetera, et cetera. It just gets more complex. Sometimes this method here is easier. Instead of plugging in this for the x value in the inverse, you could just plug in this for the y value in the function and then solve for the x value in the function, which will give you the y value in the inverse. Okay, anyway, um, I'll keep this up here actually for reference. So the next function f of x equals x cubed plus 12. So in this case, let's actually find the equation of the inverse. So we got x cubed plus 12. How do we find the equation of the inverse? We switch to x and y, so we'll have x equals y to the power of 3 plus 12. Bring the 12 over, so we'll have x minus 12 equals y to the power of 3. And then to get the y by itself, we have to take the third root of both sides. And when we do that, we'd end up with y equals the third root of x minus 12. So we isolate it for that new y, and basically that is our inverse right there. And so to find f of negative 1, 4, we just plug in 4 for this x value. Okay, so f of negative 1, 4 would be the third root of 4 minus 12, which would be the third root of negative 8, which would give us negative 2. Right, so that is the answer for the second function. That's what f of negative 1, 4 is going to be. Okay, what if we did it this other way? So what if we just use the function instead? So what we would be doing, again, let's write this out. We're trying to find the value of the inverse when the x value in the inverse is 4. So we're looking for this a value, which is the same thing as solving for the x value in the function when the y value of the function is 4. So we could plug in 4 into the function for the y value. And so we, we would end up with negative 8 equals x cubed. Third root, both sides to get the x by itself. We'd get the third root of negative 8, which would give us negative 2, which is what we got before. Right? So multiple ways to do it. You could find the, um, the inverse expression, then plug in 4 for the x value of the inverse, or you could just plug in 4 for the y value in the function. Now, check this out, this third function. Let's write this out. We got y equals 2x plus 2 to the power of x. Now, what if we try to find the uh, expression for the inverse for this? We'll have x equals 2y plus 2 to the power of y. And now we've got to isolate for this y value. How do we do that? How do we do that with a linear function and then an exponential function? Right, we can't just factor out a y. You can't factor out a y from an exponential function. I don't know. Personally, I don't know how to do that. Right? So sometimes you can't find that, um, that expression for the inverse. And sometimes you have to use this method. So this is a case where we have to use this method. So again, we're finding the x value. We're finding the value of the inverse when the x value of the inverse is 4. That's the same thing when the function has a y value, uh, y value of 4. And then here, another thing you may run into is where you can't necessarily algebraically solve for this x value. And sometimes you just have to kind of look at it and do trial and error. So if we pick an x value of 0, <clears throat> we'll have 2 times 0, which is 0, plus 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. So we'll have 0 plus 1. 
but that doesn't equal 4. What about an x value of 1? Well, if we have 1 here for x, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 to the power of 1 is 2, and then 2 plus 2 gives us 4. So notice that with trial and error, we realize that an x value of 1 will work for this function. And so an x value of 1 gives us a y value of 4 for the function, which means an x value of 4 in the inverse will give us a y value of 1 in the uh, inverse. And so this here is positive 1. And we have to do it with a bit of trial and error. Okay, so two different ways to find these expressions. Sometimes, remember, you got to do it this way. You got to plug in this value for the y value in the function, especially if the function is really complex and you can't get an expression for the inverse. Okay, now for this one, what are we looking for here? Well, notice that f of negative 1, 4, we already have for all three functions. So really, what we're finding in this case, let me erase this. In this case, we're finding f of negative 1. In this case, we're finding f of negative 2. And then in this case, we're finding f of 1. Right? Because this bracket here, we solve for in this column. And so, pretty easy. All we have to do is plug in negative 1 into the function. So, f of negative 1 is going to be 1 over 4 to the power of negative 1, which is like the fraction flip, which is like 4 over 1, which is 4 to the power of 1, which is just 4. Okay, here we're finding f of negative 2, which would be negative 2 to the power of 3, which is negative 8 plus 12, which gives us 4. So this is going to be 4. And then f of 1, if we plug in 1 for the x value, we'll get 4 again. So why did we get 4 each time here? Well, there's actually a rule. The reason why I brought this up is I actually want to introduce you to a rule where if you see something like this, so the value of the inverse at a, and then you take the function of that, that's always going to equal that a value. Right? So notice how it worked out with these three functions. And the reason is, let me kind of show you this on the side. So we have f of x, and then we have the inverse. So what are we doing here? In general, we got a and b. So this, this f negative 1a, means we're plugging in an x value of a in the inverse to get a y value of b for the inverse. But in the function, it's just that coordinate interchanged. So notice that f of negative 1 of a, this, is always going to give us that b value. But then notice that f of that b value, remember this whole thing's going to be b, so f of b is always just going to equal a. Right? So it almost like loops back around to its starting point. Right? And that's why all of these were always for. So whenever you see something like this, it's just going to be that value right there. And that's really helpful because what if I give you some crazy function like, I don't know, let's say x squared plus ln x uh, plus 2 to the power of x minus, uh, let's say, 100. Something like that. Okay? And I ask you, what's f of f negative 1 of, let's say, um, 10? Right? Are you going to find the inverse of this expression and then plug in 10 into that inverse? 
and then take that number and then plug it into the x value of this function, you're not going to be able to do that. But if you recognize this rule, you can just say easily that that's equal to 10. You don't have to do all that, even if you get a really complex function like this. So it's an example of where they might give you something complex like this just to trick you, but really the answer is pretty simple because you're just using this rule. Another rule that is not shown in this question, let me erase this, is the other way, is if we go f of negative 1, f of a, that's always going to equal to a as well, right? So if we switch these up. Reason being, let's erase these, f of a, that's like plugging in an x value of a. Let's pretend we get a y value, some kind of y value of b, right? So let's say this f of a is just equal to b. Well, f of negative 1, what we're going to be doing is then plugging in that value into the inverse, that b value into the inverse. But notice that since a was the x value of the function, it's going to be the y value of the inverse. And so again, we're just going to end up back where we started, right? So these two rules can be useful to remember, especially if you get something really complex, a really complex function where you have to use this rule and you don't really have to do anything with the function. Just if you know this rule, then you know that it's always going to equal that a value. And yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to get across in this video.